Once again, good afternoon, everyone. My name's Adam, and welcome to another APAC webinar. Today, we'll be discussing the topic, increased team performance with Canvas content management tools. Today, I'm joined by Connie and Ian from our learning services team. You may have seen them uh, throughout your training if you're just onboarded. Um, but today, we're gonna be discussing certain key elements of what makes good content pass, what tools are actually available in Canvas, and more importantly, um, yeah, just to make your life that little bit easier. So as I mentioned before, please feel free to ask any questions as we go. But, well, you're probably sick of looking at my facial hair already. So I'm gonna pass this directly on to Ian to start the proceedings for today. Thanks very much, Adam. And I'm going to go straight to screen sharing. So you can see on the screen that the today's topic is indeed content management. And I'm joined today by my colleague, Connie Koo, who's going to be sharing the load of doing demonstrations for our webinar today. And our plan is, because we're not quite sure what people might have in the way of questions or interest in this topic, we're going to go through a bit of a survey of um, sort of the overview of content management inside Canvas. We're going to look at some of the considerations that should be front of mind when you're thinking about content management. I'm assuming you have some experience with managing content, but you may not have explored all of the potential um, options you've got in Canvas or some of the issues might not have come up for you yet. So hearing us talk about them or responding to questions that might come in from other participants today might give you some other ideas to consider. Then we're gonna go through just a quick survey of the different ways in which you can move content around inside Canvas. Um, and then we'll be open for questions and exploring any of the sort of issues that might not have been addressed by our um, examples and our overview that might be something that's brought you along today. But we're going to start off with a very quick overview of the issue around content management inside Canvas. Many of you um, will understand that you have uh, a structure inside your Canvas instance the root account is the thing that holds all of your Canvas instance, but it's quite common for that root account to be broken up into sub accounts. So your organization either is reflected in that sub account structure or you've chosen to make certain sub account structures to manage the workflows inside your organization. But the important thing is that your sub accounts, if they exist, are the places where your courses are housed. Their courses belong to accounts, either sub accounts or root accounts or um, some intermediate sub account. And the issue really with considering content management and certainly in the context that Adam alluded to there is that there's initially an issue of where is the content that you need to manage best located and best managed structurally. But then there's also the issue of that management process through time. So we're gonna primarily look at the structural aspects today initially and then we'll consider some of the issues around the time management or the management of content through time towards the end. So we think there are a couple of things that you should have in your mind when you're thinking about the issue of content management. First issue is how often is the resource going to change? If a resource is not likely to change very much, it doesn't make a lot of sense to have a lot of copies of it low down in the hierarchy, because that means there's a lot of places you have to go to make updates to it. So things that are infrequently changing, generally are gonna be better sitting higher up in the hierarchy because they're easy to change and roll out. And that does raise the question of, if you're gonna have things at different levels in your Canvas instance, um, what's the best place for it to um, have the changes made at? So where is the place that's the best to make the changes? Third question is who is going to be making those changes? Things that change infrequently, sitting higher up, are most likely to be done by people who've got some sort of account access, root or sub account or something like that. If it's lower down, it's something that changes extremely frequently, it's much more likely to be a person with course level permissions. And the last question there, which we'll just we'll consider when it comes to the sort of organizational issues around content management, is how important is consistency for you as an organization across all of your courses in a particular time period or consistency over time? Different organizations have different 
um, interest in or different imperatives towards um, different levels of consistency. Some want to have an awful lot of consistency. Some don't really mind if things are inconsistent. But these are the issues that come back to decisions you're going to be making around how you manage content. Are there any questions about those as general questions or issues that might come up? also like to say that it's, it's really good. Um, thank you, Ian, for bringing these up so early because these are sorts of things that we also talk about as, as a CSM level um, that we need you to clearly articulate from the get-go because we can help build these in for longer term success and you have less chance of moving things around. Obviously, for how often will the resource change is completely unique to you. Um, the level of the sub accounts is obviously very important for one such content sharing tool, which we'll definitely dive into, I have no doubt. Um, and who should be able to make the changes is also very important. So based on the permissions of that person um, and the users in that system, you can control what some users can and can't do. So it's really important to, uh, to, be, to ensure that you enroll your users correctly. But it looks like the, um, everyone's a bit quiet or they're eagerly anticipating uh, Coco to do something a little bit crazy. So um, Ian, um, I'd continue away. I shall. So we'll continue with the overview and just as a quick refresher for people in terms of um, the ways in which you can move content around inside Canvas. So we're going to start off from the perspective of a teacher or a faculty member who wants to start moving some content around. It's the basic unit inside most organisations in terms of people responsible for content management, the teacher, there are other people who will be responsible, but the base level in most organizations is the teacher level. So let's think about what a teacher is going to be doing. So a teacher's going to be enrolled in and have teacher permissions in a course. And in that course, they have an interest in moving some content from it to another course. So it's possible to use the direct share functionality that's in Canvas to move an item from a course that you're currently in as a teacher to another course. Equally, the teacher could be in that course that she's enrolled in and pull content from another course. The reason why the two arrows are different sizes is just to remind you that when you're pushing something out of a course you're currently in to another course that you're also enrolled in, you can move items when you're in a course and you want to bring all the course content from another course, you can pull it in, you can pull all of it in. So that's why the arrows are different sizes there. So the teacher is enrolled in all three courses and can either push out an item or pull all the content in. She might also like to share some of the work that she's done in one of those courses with a colleague. So she can send that item that she wants to share to her colleague. She doesn't need to let the colleague into that course. She doesn't have to do an enrollment. She can just push it to him. It's a really great bit of flexibility in Canvas that gets around either the teacher having to do the enrol or an admin having to do the enrol. They can just share amongst that themselves. It's a really neat aspect if you haven't used it already. Now in that course as well, Connie can, Connie, the teacher can share out to Commons um, Connie may well be doing that fairly soon, but the teacher can move content out from her course out to Commons. They can share it out to Commons. And once it's in Commons, it can also be imported back into courses either as a whole course, a thick arrow or a thin arrow, individual items can be imported into courses. Commons is really excellent from that point of view that uh, it allows a variety of object types from a full course right down to a single page to be stored and then shared out. So this is all a teacher perspective of moving things around inside Canvas. There's also the organisational perspective, which is that sometimes the organisation wants to have some control or influence over what's in courses. And so that course with a little blue board around it is a course that has been filled with content or structure or both as a result of being associated with a blueprint course. So that's something where the organisation, an admin, has made a, made a course and that has been mapped onto, associated with a course that that teacher is enrolled in. So that's a little bit of a, a schematic, a little bit of a roadmap of the core ways in which you can move 
content that teachers are likely to create around the system and how they can interact with it. There's a couple more layers there in terms of institutionally controlled things like um, assessment resources like uh, rubrics and question banks and uh, outcomes, but we'll save that for a, a later on. So that's the basic perspective on the routes that content can take around Canvas from a teacher perspective. So right now, I am going to throw to Coco, to mm -hmm. Connie, and Connie's going to go through the process of demonstrating those two varieties of direct share, copying to a course and copying to a colleague, who strange enough might be me. <laughs> <laughs> before I start, Coco, I was about to say that slide before is actually a, probably the clearest way I've mm -hmm. actually seen that presented in a long time. So well uh -huh. done, team. that's awesome. I'm stealing that off you, no doubt at all. Thank you. It's, it's, we don't it's call going... in Slide King for no reason. Ah, okay. Okay. All righty. I, I shall bestow it on you, Adam, at some stage. <laughs> bestow. Very real. Also, Thank you. I also love how Ian made me redhead, right? <laughs> <laughs> we just slide if you go left again. Um, I'm joking, but I've always wanted to dye my hair red, so maybe you can vote in the chat below if you think Connie should dye her hair red. <laughs> <laughs> I would have created a poll. If I'd known, I would have created a poll. <laughs> okay. Um, so I'm just going to pop in now. I'm going to pretend I'm that redheaded teacher who, can you all see my screen? Just checking. Uh, it's just coming up now, Coco. It says mm -hmm. it started your screen sharing, but it hasn't come up just yet. Okay. Uh, yep. It's now yeah. available for us all. Excellent. Okay, so let's pretend I'm this redheaded teacher who loves cooking. I am a cooking extraordinaire and I am a teacher of that. Um, and there is a particular assignment, however, funny enough, in biology that I really want to put into my gastronomy class. Who would have thought it? There's some science behind cooking. So I'm going to go ahead and find that item inside my biology course. So I'm just going to go ahead and press it. And it's a particular assignment. And that particular assignment is um, describing this picture. Okay, I just love this particular assignment in biology. And I actually want to bring that into my gastronomy course. So, so simple. All I have to do is press, I'm just going to zoom in. I apologize if it's a bit slow. Can you see these three dots here? We call it the traffic lights or um, maybe a pepper grinder, whatever you want to call it. Um, click it and all you have to do is press, um, copy to, so the button here, and then you can find the course that you want to copy it to. So I'm in biology. It's actually course one, it's my gastronomy course. And you can choose under which module you want to actually put that particular assignment into. So I'm going to go ahead and put it into um, my cooking styles. Uh, that's my second module. And I can simply say, do I want it at the top? Think of it in the sandwich top at the, you know, in the middle between some other content or at the very end. I'm just going to go ahead and put it at the very top of this particular module. Press copy. It says it's going to do. Give it a few seconds. Um, you know, give it, do a little song and dance and then it should be ready. So I'm going to go into my dashboard now. Go into the gastronomy course. And there you go. Describe this picture. This assignment has so easily just moved straight into this. Um, so, you know, when we talk about efficiency and we talk about, you know, really good content sharing happening fast, you don't need to save it on your desktop first, put it on the cloud and then import it. You can literally bring it from one course into another course as long as you're the same teacher of it. That's how easy it can be. Now, let's talk about a bit of collaboration and teamwork. Uh, let's say Ian um, is really quite curious about this describe this picture because it got a lot of good positive feedback from other students um, and he says to me Connie could you please send me that particular assignment I really want to just look at it and decide if I want to put it in one of my own courses um, now Ian is not enrolled in any of these courses nor does he have to be because he teaches completely different subjects so I'm not going to enroll him here I'm simply going to get this one assignment so I'm going to go ahead back into my assignments here in gastronomy and um, I'm going to go ahead and find this particular assignment um, I actually might have a bit of fun and um, I'm going to send him a Greek food research essay just for fun and I'm going to go ahead and just press these buttons 
Is it gluten free? Yeah. Did you say gluten free? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, I know him well. I know he wants the gluten-free one. So I'll go ahead and press send to. So you can see here, it's actually very um, close to the one I just showed you. Copy to is me as a teacher from one course to another. Send to is sending to another person. So I just press send to. I find Ian's name. Okay, Ian admin. And I just press send. And that's it. So um, I'm about to go ahead and let him share the screen. And then he can show us what it's like to be on the receiving end of this Greek food research essay. Is food a consistent theme? I just got to try and coordinate my jokes for the rest of the day. Uh, <laughs> it actually is. A lot of Ian's analogies are very food based. Good. <laughs> just checking. Oh, okay. can you see my screen? Okay. Is that coming up? Uh, yes, I can. Eh? Excellent. So everybody, um, I've just been sent that item from the course and you can may well see over here, if I can get it to appear. No, it doesn't want to do it. Oh, there it goes. So you can see here that we've got my account um, spot and it's got a little badge above it saying, I've been sent an item. At least there's one new item there. So if I click, I can see under my admin account here, I've been shared some content. If I click, I'll see what the item is. You can see it's my Greek food research essay. It's assignment type, it's come from Connie Teacher. And over here, I have some actions. So I can click on the actions. I've got three actions. One is to preview it. One is to import it into a course. Or if I don't feel like that particular bit of um, food today, I can get rid of it. <laughs> I'm gonna actually import it though. A healthy way to get rid of it. So. <laughs> it could be, yes. So I can decide where I'd like to put this particular um, assignment. So I'm going to put it into my training B course. This unfortunately is an empty course, so there's nothing there. So I can't place it into a particular location, but I can still import it. It's now on its way there. And if I come back to my dashboard over here, and I go into training B, because it's an empty site, there's nothing going to show up here. But if I come over to assignments, there it is. Greek food research essay has gone straight across. Because there were no modules for it to go in, it's gone to that particular heading inside assignments, just to make it quite clear that it wasn't, wasn't from here. It's come from outside. But um, it's a very, very neat way of teachers or content creators being able to shift material around without having to worry about um, enrollments and things like that. The beauty of the direct share into uh, sending it to colleagues is that you know that they might have some use for it, but you don't have to know or worry about when they might use it or where they might use it, it's up to them. So it takes away some of those issues of, yes, I could put it into this particular course for you, but they may not want to use it in that course, they may want to use it in a different course in the future. So it's a very neat solution to that problem of not always knowing where something is going to be used. So that's sharing things that come in on direct share from a colleague. And you'll notice that my account has lost a little badge up there saying that it um, has got something new for me. Excellent. So let's go and have a look at the issue of copying whole courses. So that was item level copying. Let's go and have a look at the whole course copying issue. So I've got a couple of unpublished courses down here. This one here, Biology 101, I'd like to have all the content of that put into my training A course, which is currently empty. So let's go and have a look at Biology 101 to see what it looks like. So it's full of stuff. And I want to take all of this across into my training A. I want to make a copy of it. So those of you who are thinking about this, you're thinking, oh, this is pretty much the same as this might be the 2020 version. And I'm going to put it into the 2021 shell that's uh, there for, for next year or well, this is the next offering or the next run of this particular course. And it all looks pretty good. I'm going to take it all across and use it as is. Or there's a few things in 101 that I'd like to change, but there's no point changing them here in the 2020 version. Better to move all of it across into the 2021 and then do my updates there. So let's see what happens here. What's different about copying whole courses is that you have to be where the content's going to end up. What Connie was doing before was she was where the content was 
and she was pushing it out. She was in a course and she was pushing it to another course or she was pushing it to a colleague. We're going to go into the pool business now. So we have to be in training A and we're going to pull biology 101 in. So nice big empty course here. I've got two ways of doing this. I can go across over here to import existing content or I could do the same thing via settings, but this button's big and obvious here. So I'm going to choose this one. It doesn't matter which one you choose. You end up in the same place, which is at this page, importing content. Content type, well, Canvas has got lots of flexibility about importing different content types. The obvious one, which is what we're about to do now, is just copying a Canvas course. So what we're doing there is we're moving content from one part of Canvas to another. So that's sort of within the system. The next one down is bringing back into Canvas something that's been exported from it. So there are situations in which you might like to export things out of either this Canvas or somebody else's Canvas and then bring them in. And then likewise, it could come in as a zip folder and then there's other LMS formats if you're migrating. But we're going to do this one up here, the Copy a Canvas course, click on that. Now what I have to do is to say, well, where am I copying from? Where am I going to pull the content from? Simple matter of starting to type. Canvas is very smart. It knows what I can see. So it's listing all those courses that I can see. And so I can pull up the one that I want. Clearly, it's only going to show me the things that I have access to. This doesn't work if, I, if I'm not enrolled in that particular source course. Terrible um, cooking pun there, not intended. So here we have the option to take either all the content or just some specific content. I'm going to take all content because in this situation, what I'm going to be doing is pulling the whole lot across. If I did just want to take part of it, particular parts of it, so take just the quizzes or just the assignments, I could select that, select specific um, content there and just get that. But in this particular case, this is more like a rollover situation where I just want to take last year's and put it into next year so it can be modified. Um, I could adjust the events as well. So if I wanted to go through the process of saying all the dates that are there at the moment, I'm going to adjust them for the coming year. There are ways of doing that so that it lines up. It's a little bit fiddly, but you can certainly do that if you know your dates. Um, let's do the import. Over here, it's saying our current job is course copy. We're copying this particular course. This is when it's happening and it's currently queued. Now that can be a slightly depressing moment because you think, oh, this is going to take forever, but unless we're extremely unlucky, it will start moving. There it goes. So the process is underway at the moment. That's the progress bar. And if I don't, well, I could keep talking or Adam could tell a joke for a moment, but it will actually get through quite quickly. Yeah. And that is actually the process of moving the files. So I was actually going to say that depends on the size of the course and, and what we're trying to move as well, um, which will kind of uh, dictate the speed and obviously your uh, internet connection as well. Mm. Indeed. So that wasn't a really large, a large course. So yes, if it was a massive course, obviously it would take longer. The couple of issues have been picked up there and probably because this is just a, a dummy course, it's probably got some links that aren't working, but it's certainly something you can check on the way through. I won't waste time on that now. But what we just did then was that we moved this course, Biology 101, into Training A, and you notice that it's inherited the course um, image, and if I open it up, we can see that it's got all the same content. So very straightforward process for copying content between courses. Now, I'm doing this in a teacher role, so I've got the permissions in this particular teacher role to do that, and that's going to be something that you might have um, in your organization as well. And there are sort of pluses and minuses about having teachers do their copying. But in this particular case, I, as the teacher, have access to this one, which as far as we're concerned today is the old version, Biology 101, the old version, and Training A is the new version. So now we've got two copies in the system, one that's sort of no longer of any interest because it's the, the finished course or about to be finished, and Training A is the new one, that's the one we're going to work in. So that's the process of copying course content. And just before we um, just before we go further, um, at the present moment, a lot of people have asked us about you know sharing quizzes, uh, new quizzes, and things like that. That's probably the best way to do that if you want to share like an entire course and subset is via the copy um, feature. And another thing that Ian did allude to there, which is also really important, is that 
you can, um, you need to start thinking about naming conventions as well. Like if you're building collectively in a master course, what are you going to call that master course to then obviously transpose that content to something else? So if your student information systems providing those courses for you um, that are just empty shell courses, then you don't need to worry about, but it's also really good to understand, you know, the year or the version number or something along those lines so you can easily recognize where you're going. So, sorry, Ian. Um, yeah, we seem to be questionless thus far. They must be amazed. That's okay. Um, I'm going to throw it to Connie now to talk about using commons as a way of moving course content around. You ready to go, Connie? Yeah, catching the ball. It's my turn now. Catching the big orange, I guess. Okay, so talking about naming conventions, uh, Ian wonderfully already did it, but you can see that in my scenario as a red-headed gastronomy teacher, I also teach biology in this case, and I have an unpublished course with no students enrolled called Biology 2021. So, you know, probably closer to the end of the year, I will do what Ian just did, which is copy over everything from here into biology 2021 so that I've got the same course content, um, but then I can just enroll all the students uh, that I have for 2021 in there. So then it's fresh copy. So naming conventions and seeing that you can copy it easily through that. Now, in terms of comments, I'm going to show you two things. We've been doing a bit of a push and pull um, description. And so I'm going to show you that I can actually pull some things from a global source, a global library source that you actually have access to called Commons into my gastronomy course. Okay, I'm gonna show you, I can pull that in and then I'm gonna push it out and I'm actually gonna share something to Ian as well using Commons actually, uh, because we, um, you know, we don't, we're both not enrolled in this course. So how else can I share things with him? Instead of just direct sharing individual items with him, I wanna direct, I wanna share a whole course. So let's let's actually do a bit of pulling. I'm gonna go back into my gastronomy course. And you know, like a lot of teachers and researchers, I'm very curious about what other experts of food um, are teaching, how they're teaching it, what does that look like, you know? So I'm gonna actually go ahead <laughs> and I'm gonna go and press something called now. There's two places you can either do import from commons. So that's how I'm gonna view commons or you can literally just press the comments button and it'll take you uh, to a similar location. So I'm just gonna press import existing, um, no, not that one, sorry. Import from comments. <laughs> okay, and it's taking me into my comments and comments is simply a repository of, uh, of courses, uh, material, quizzes, assignments that people uh, all over the world, you know, we have, as you know, Canvas is a global product. It's um, popular in the Philippines, in Bali, uh, in the US. So anyone who wanted to share uh, their information publicly, we can actually find it here. There's, I've sometimes seen things from, yeah, Harvard, for example, um, Melbourne, a lot of different business schools around the world. But I'm going to go ahead and just look for, let's look for food studies. And I can see a lot of material, quizzes, images, assignments, <laughs> the Sarancha documentary film quiz, why not? Um, there's so much different content here. Nutritional healing, I love this. So, you know, one, if we're talking about collaboration, of course you can collaborate with the people who are in your institution. But as a, as a teacher, you're probably a constant learner as well. So I actually love sometimes just moseying in here and just seeing what other people are doing. Um, and then just, you know, viewing what their content is. So I'm going to go look at this, uh, not a whole course, I just want a module. Okay, here we go, nutritional study guide. So I'm going to go into here. And here I can just see some, some details. Okay, great. So it's a, talk, it's a study guide focusing on the purpose function of food sources. I'm happy with that. So I'm just going to go ahead and have a preview and actually just bring it into my course because you can always delete it afterwards. And all I have to do is press import slash download, find the course that I want. So it would be, here we go, uh, gastronomy course, there you go. And just import into course. That's all I'm gonna do. And just let it wait for a bit, see how it goes. 
and yeah, as you can see here, this is a lot of um, a lot of different content across the world internationally. And sometimes people will ask me, um, you know, are we allowed to use it? What is the IP academic integrity of using something from Commons? You know, once again, it's your choice. To, it's their choice to upload it, knowing that it could be publicly used. It's also your choice to use it as well. So even though, like for me, I love to go through the content, but you have to go with a fine tooth comb. You're not necessarily going to teach from it. I use it more from inspiration perhaps. So I've let it import. So I'm going to go into my dashboard, go into my gastronomy course. Uh, and then you can go ahead and see that there's the nutritional study guide here. No content though. So this was a little bit of a um, not great module to import from Commons, but you can go ahead and see here. Okay, there's actually a module that was there. So that's how easy it is to just go ahead and bring any content that you find in Commons. So that's one way to pull things in. I'm actually going to quickly go into just why, just why you're, or yeah, just why you're doing that. I might be jumping the gun here as well. Um, it's also really important when you're considering this as well is that uh, Coco has obviously just used the public forum that's mm. actually available, which is holds everything that anyone has uploaded up to Commons. When you go to upload something to Commons, you can choose to just share that with a group of say particular teachers or faculties or departments, if your um, if your admins have set that up, you also have the option to just share with yourself, or you have the option to just share with people inside your instance. Now, as a default, most CSMs we choose to show usually choose to turn off shared publicly mm. um, because we you as understand it usually sometimes is a little bit more confusing. So if you do have any other questions like that, feel free to reach out to your um, your Canvas admin or if you're an admin and you're confused, please feel free to book in some time with your CSM. Yeah, thanks, Adam. Exactly. So this is me just pulling things in from Commons if I'm just curious as to looking at it. Now, there's, there's a whole other process which um, Adam has touched on, which is pushing that content out. So you can see, here we go, this module actually was a good example. Um, I just pulled this one from Commons, so healthy eating, and you can see all the pages, the quizzes, assignments, and discussions, links, everything that was in this module that I got from Commons is here. This one also was here, but they never loaded any content, so there you go. You win some, you lose some, but that's a good point with Commons. You need to look at the content first before you go ahead and publish it and let your students see it. Okay, now let's talk about if, this is a scenario, um, Ian has asked me, um, can I actually see your particular, I see you have a cooking styles module and, you know, I'm, I'm quite curious. I actually want to, um, explore the whole module, not just each individual assignment or page. I want to look at the whole module. Can you, um, can you share that with me? How can you do that? So one of uh, the most common way to share modules, so more than just individual bitty items, and you don't necessarily want to like export the whole course for him to import, an easy way is to use Commons as a library. And as, he, um, as Adam has touched on, you can make it so just people inside of your organization can see it. So Ian can easily find it. But let's go ahead and do that now. This cooking styles. Ian loves the look of that. He's very curious about Greek food. And I said, why not? I'll let you see about French and Chinese food too. So I'm going to go ahead and press this button and I'm going to choose this icon that says share to comments. That's it. Once I go ahead and press that. Upload. Okay. So yes, as you can see here, um, there are some options of who can actually use this resource. Um, there is the option of public. So I was just in public. I brought over that content from a public domain. Now, as Adam said, you can actually turn this off and remove it completely because sometimes people do have concerns about protecting their own IP and their own course material. So it's actually often hidden. Um, but in this case, if I want to just share it to me, so it's always in the cloud for me to find, I can go ahead and press only me. In this case, I want all of APAC who have this list to be able to um, see this. So Ian and any other teacher who wants to access this, I can. Okay, so once I've done that, just scroll down. If there's a particular content type, like this is a template that I want everyone in APAC to have access to, I could press that. But right now it's not, it's a module, it's not really relevant. In terms of the license, I can choose whether or not um, I, when I'm sharing it, if I want to, it to be copyrighted or I want it to be a public domain so anyone else can use it. In this case, it's in, within APAC um, LS, so it would be copyrighted. 
metadata. So that's just further information about uh, this particular course I've placed in this common lab, this library. And if anyone wants to find it, I can make it easier by adding some metadata. So some descriptions about, um, so what was it? There was Chinese, Greek, um, French cooking styles. And that's what I'm actually going to go ahead and um, tag it so that Ian can find it easier in the, in the future. And this is actually quite useful, especially if you're going to be allowing this to be seen by everyone in your institution. So when we talk about making it easier to share content, find content to collaborate and work together, trying to just, you know, make it as streamlined as possible and giving it as much definition so that people can find it is really useful. And I'm just going to quickly add a, wow, these are, these are nice images. I'm going to use this one. Okay. That's food styles, isn't it? So I'm going to actually look up food. Um, super random images. I'm going to just use this one, and I go in, and I can also say what age group is it. Okay, so this one is a little bit before, maybe I would say 11 to graduate age, and hit share. So I've just gone ahead and I've placed that directly into my comments. So now um, anyone who's in APAC LS should be able to find it. So I'm going to go ahead and throw uh, the metaphoric ball back to Ian, and he can actually show us what it looks like for him to try and find what I just put up there in comments. Cool. So you should be able to see my screen now, yeah? Yeah. Okay. So um, Connie's popped her stuff up onto comments. So I'm just going to go searching for Greek cooking mm -hmm. and it's not finding anything. Mm. Why is that? I wonder. What's going on here? Ah, down the very bottom, you may be not able to see, but it's shared with everybody. By default, in this particular setup, the sharing is with everybody, but Connie only shared it with APAC. Mm. So because it was shared internally, and in this particular instance, it's not only shareable to the outside world, but it also shows all the outside world's content, that little search does have that little extra kick to it. But you can see here that I've got um, now access to this module. And so now I can import it where I like. Commons is a really good way of managing content if you want largely the people who are teaching or the content creators in your organization to manage that process. It is something that sits outside the structure of um, accounts. So it's not they're not locked in in some sense to they can only see the stuff in the maths department. They can see everything there. Um, it gives the flexibility to share a lot or a little, bring it in when you want and modify it when you want. So it does, it does provide an awful lot of flexibility for the teachers and the content creators to manage content themselves. Um, as Adam alluded to, there's a lot of options under the admin um, settings here that allow you to turn off sharing to the outside world, even viewing the outside world, how you can filter out um, items so that they don't see all the stuff that's meant for kindergarten when they go searching. If you happen to be a tertiary institution and you can talk about what uh, the sharing settings are. So the admins can set up a lot of characteristics here that will increase the utility of um, commons as a place for teachers to manage content and content through time themselves. It does have um, a lot of advantages. It has one small disadvantage is that if they use it as a place to store the latest version of their material and somebody uses it, there's no automatic connection that tells them that there's a newer version to use. They have to check and they also have to choose to use it. That's a little bit different to the other characteristic that um, uh, Canvas has that allows for the organization to essentially mandate what goes into courses, either in whole or part, and that's using a system called Blueprint Courses. So just saying Commons is a place where teachers and content creators kind of have control, but in the Blueprint course process, that's the organisation having control. Just very quickly, I just want to point out that Blueprints 
are things that are associated with account level because clearly all courses have to live at an account. So the question is going to be if you put the blueprint course that you want to dictate or mandate content down below at the root level, in other words, it covers the whole organization, all courses in the organization can see it and be linked to it. And you can use that to put some structure into all courses if you wanted, or you could use it to put some content in if you wanted to. And you'd be doing that at the organizational level. So you say everyone has to have four modules at the top of their course that you know talk about student um, uh, advice, you know, procedure documents and all that sort of stuff. So the official sort of things that will be pushed out like that into all your courses. And then that, that provides the empty shell, but partially filled for teachers and content creators to work with. Equally, you could do it at the sub-account level so that if you have a structure where you might have the maths department, the English department, biology department, and possibly the Greek cooking department as well, you could have blueprints at that level where the same process could work. You could actually have some content being pushed down, some standard stuff to do with maths or biology or whatever that you want in all of your courses under that, that account, or not all, all the ones that are linked, I should say. But equally, you can use blueprint courses to force content completely down into, say, oh, and make up the entire course. So that, that rightmost example there is probably the sort of thing you would do in situations where you don't want the content creators or the people teaching the course to be able to modify the content. This is at the other end of, here's an empty shell, go add content to it for your teacher or content creator. This is the organization saying, no, this is the content we like, this is the structure we like, this is what you're going to drive. So that probably is at sort of the RTO or the training organization end where the people who deliver aren't the ones who necessarily create and there's good institutional or organizational reasons not to allow for modification. So let's go have a look at how that works in practice. Let's go back to dashboard. So say we, we quite like biology 101. So if that biology 101 is what we wanted to be the copy. So we used it before to move all the content into training A because we were just doing a rollover. And I did that as a teacher. So if I wanted the organization to have some control over all future biology 101s, all I need to do is to go into the course, first of all, make sure that there are no students enrolled because blueprint courses being the master copy can't actually have students or student data in them because really it's just some combination of structure and content that's going to be associated with and mandated and pushed down into courses that are linked to it. So the way that you turn something from an ordinary course with some content and some structure into a blueprint, you go to settings and in settings, it's already turned on. You're, so I did this before. Um, so the blueprint is here. So you just turn it onto a blueprint and the first option you have is that you can set it to be everything locked. And by default, usually that one's turned on. So just saying everything in this course is going to have its content locked. And when it's locked, it means the person teaching the course can't touch it, can't edit it, can't modify it or delete it. So at the RTO training end, where the teachers just deliver and don't have the job of creating or adding to the content, that could be a good way of pushing that content out. If that doesn't work for you, but you basically it's just like to send everything down there um, and maybe have the points for the assessment or the due dates or so on, you could do that. Equally, if you wanted to lock it by type, so if you wanted to have the assignments completely locked with their points and due dates and so on, you could do that. You might leave the discussions open to be modified because they might be something that the person running the course needs to modify for them. Maybe the pages, you'll say, yeah, the pages that I've pushed down in the, in the uh, blueprint, I want to stay, but it won't stop the person running and adding some more and so on. So these are the sort of things you can do. Having done all of that, oh, that's what he said to be blueprint, that's why. What you'll see over on the right hand side is um, this blue line and the blue button, which indicates it is a blueprint, which is why it was turned on before. So when I click on that, you can see we have these two links, associations and sync history. So the associations here are currently set to zero, so nothing is being um, blueprinted. So let's go and have a look at what we can blueprint. So these are the courses that sit below this particular blueprint. Blueprints are unlike commons. Common sits outside the structure. Blueprints sit inside the structure. So it's going to be what are the courses beneath that particular sub-account or root account level 
that are available and visible. So there's the ones that I can see here. So I'm going to put this one into training C. So I'm going to make it so that the training C content is exactly mapped to what's currently in biology 101. And I do that over here in the bottom right hand corner, which may be a bit hard for you to see, but there's a little save button down there. So when I do that, you'll see it's saving the association. The association has been saved correctly. I can press done. And up here on the right, you can see that the syncing is taking place. So the processing is underway. The beauty of um, blueprints compared to um, sort of a self-serve model out of commons is that when the content needs to change, admins or people who've got access to edit the blueprint and edit the blueprint, as you saw me just doing before, and then you can resync it. In other words, you can push the changes that you've just made in your blueprint down into the one or many courses that are associated with it. So at the moment, we've got one association and we've got a sync history that says that's what's been done. Let's go back to dashboard and have a look. Inside training C, we can see that that's now got all the content that was in biology 101. And if we make changes in biology 101, it'll get pushed down. So this is where the organization gets some control over what is appearing in courses. So this can be useful in situations, as I said, where either you want to, or the organization needs to have complete control over what is appearing there and how it's structured, or it wants to have control over, or at least starter um, structure for um, teachers and content creators to work with. So if the suggestion from the organization is that it's always done with a weak structure or a topic structure in modules, then they could push out some empty structure there, or they could always put in certain sorts of content and lock it. So official documents or guides to students or things like that could be pushed down across the board. It's a very neat system, but it does um, have different advantages and different disadvantages in different contexts. So very large organisations might like this if they want to have some baseline consistency. Small organisations might find it too much trouble to be doing that because it's just easy to make the modifications themselves on the fly. So somewhere between those two ends of a very large organisation and a very small and different teaching situations, the blueprints could be very useful. Let's just go through a quick um, run through of the distinction between commons and blueprints. So as I was saying, commons is really a self-serve model for teachers and content creators. Blueprint is primarily about um, the organization having some influence or um, control over what appears in courses, either a very little or a lot. So again, the distinction is commons is outside the structure, so anybody can go and use it. Blueprints sit inside the structure, so they're ideal for situations where you want to have different look and feel or different content in maths compared to English compared to biology. Um, the big difference also is that in commons, changes are optional to take them up and in blueprint, they're not. So what are the distinctions between these two? Sharing over time, blueprint is probably something where if there needs to be control over the actual content inside courses, Blueprint is going to work better because there's fewer places for it to be changed. The organization can make those decisions. You might have a head of department who's got um, a certain level of um, admin permissions in a sub account to make the changes, or there might be a learning designer or something like that who's got access there and they can update the material that's in the course. And then that becomes the template for the course content that goes into all future offerings. If it's done in commons, it's really up to the teachers and content creators to manage that process themselves. And depending on the size of the organization and what the turnover of those people are, that could also work quite well. It really is, it's a horses for courses um, option, but the beauty of what Canvas um, provides you is that you really can go from lots and lots of control through to lots of freedom between those two ends of the spectrum. So, I think I've covered a fair bit. Do you want to ask me? <laughs> well, I've, I've actually, uh, I was actually sitting there going, whoa, I just forgot how uh, in-depth this particular 
thing goes for. So we have had some good questions um, in relation to the use of blueprints and how things are affected. Um, one of the, we always suggest with blueprints, um, there are, it is a really great way. I mean, for, for instance, for K to 12 establishments, we recommend it's a great way to provide that initial instructional design template to all your courses. Mm -hmm. um, if teachers are building it out, but then as you get towards the end of the year, when you're looking at going, Hey, this is the framework for a year seven math course. So there's more information in it that might be something where blueprints comes in handy because you'll then send that course template to all the year seven mass courses and then the teachers can edit from there. So it's a really um, important way to, when you're starting to think about this, obviously you want to get teachers in there straight away, obviously mm -hmm. as part of your, um, your uh, implementation and onboarding. But when you start to come around and people start to ask these questions, really important to bring in your um your csm because we can sit here and discuss what you're trying to do because it may be a mixture of commons direct share and blueprints we just don't know mm -hmm. yeah just going to throw this it's sort of a, a hybrid position where if you don't want to have all of the control of um of a blueprint and you don't have all the freedom of self-serve in commons you could make a group for certain people inside commons and you could archive copies of courses into that to then have them be the place that things get pulled from. So there are, as I said, a range of options inside Canvas and that's kind of a, a hybrid option is to use a kind of a controlled group and make archive copies there to move them across. Yep. And we are seeing a big shift, especially in vocational education, because a lot of people are going from having one course in Canvas being a whole qual to being uh, either units of competency or being um, you know, certain modules to make up a task. It's also really important that you can actually use commons for like versioning controls as well. You can see what versions of, of things people have used before them. Um, and it's a really great way to share those across the course. Um, Susan's asked a question to just the panelists, but I'll repeat it on here. How long should you keep a course in your system? You can keep it for as long as you want. <laughs> there, is, there is no thing there. What I would suggest you do though, is to ensure obviously for you know measuring student usage and things like that i strongly suggest that you make sure that your sections or your course dates have a start and end date um, and i'd also recommend that after a period of time you do conclude those courses um, and possibly if you have like a, a if you're using terms have a you know a, t a previous year term or a some sort of concluded term so you can move those courses out. So it's really easy to search for the courses that are relevant at the particular moment. But no, there's no reason for you to delete your courses um, because if you do delete them, they're only soft deleted anyway. Um, so my suggestion is just conclude them um, so you can easily go back and access them. But where possible, do use terms to make it easily, easily accessible. Um, to other bits and pieces as well, which is really good. But um, thank you very much for the question, Susan. Um, so it's 4.20. We've gone a, gone a little bit over. No, it's, that's not true. That's true. I'm just trying to rev up Ian because I know he's very, uh, very efficient. So I'll just stand the pot <laughs> a little bit there. Um, but as I said before, um, with these webinars, we will put up a copy of this webinar, uh, including the slide deck in the next couple of days. Um, the reason why we won't be doing it tomorrow is because the campus community tomorrow is moving to a new home. Um, so we'll be down, it will be down from about 9 a.m. till 3 p.m. Australian Eastern Standard Time. Uh, in the interim, there is another guides app available for you uh, if you do need it. Also, i um, like to also let you know that CanvasCon, uh, unfortunately, it's not happening this year, which is really sad. Oh, no way. It is. It's just not happening in person. So. Uh, this year, we're actually throwing the doors open. Uh, it's free entry. It's happening in uh, October, if I remember that correctly. Um, so please feel free to, to just dial CanvasCon Sydney or CanvasCon, what do they call it? An Insta event or something? I can't remember. <laughs> but um, yeah, please feel free to ask your CSM. It's on all our signatures and everything like that. But we're really looking forward to having you um, with us this year in what is going to be probably a, a year that we remember for the rest of history. So um, once again, thank you everyone for attending this today. Um, if you have any further questions about the presentation, please feel free to book in some time with your CSM and um, yeah, we can help you work through it. So once again, thank you very much everyone and we'll speak to you soon. Bye. Bye everyone. All the best. Stay safe. Bye.